What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Talk on the Tundra, your Green Bay Packers podcast that is a proud partner of the Eurostep Podcast Network and the Blue Wire family. As always, I am your host, Numak, coming back to you in your podcast feeds with another episode of Green Bay Packers content, talking about their upcoming battle, some might call it a clash, with the Tennessee Titans, uh, fresh off the heels of their win against the Indianapolis Colts thanks to a wonderful performance by Josh Jacobs and company. But, <laughs> I don't know what that was. But Josh Jacobs running. Th- that is an interpretation. That's what we'll call that. Joining me, pantomiming how Josh Jacobs runs, is my lovely co-host, Jordan Tresky. Jordan, how are you doing, buddy? Hello, I am doing well. Well? Doing... Yeah, that's that's German for well. Is it? Yes. It's not it's not gut. Um <laughs> I believe that's good. It's the same word. I took uh, I I, I took I, 8 years of German. I certainly know all the words. I took German Thomas. The same one? You know, there are some things that you say that you regret that don't make sense. The, this, the same one? That same one. There the, he is. The same German Thomas? Oh, yes. Neato. I like how you had that on the ready. Yeah. I got stuff hanging around. I don't you know where s- I got this, but... I this is it. not premium, folks. This is uh, where you just unleashed how many koozies you had in like, your drawer. Should we, should we unbox the Gorman Thomas bobblehead? I'll we mute, could. I'll mute this so I don't get the plastic all in your ears. It's even got a bat. Jordan, you gotta talk by mute, dog. <laughs> and this, this is what I'm doing. For the listener, Numak is unboxing a bobblehead package with the likeness of Gorman Thomas, the Milwaukee Brewers outfielder from, I believe, 1975 to 1983. He's wearing a Seattle Pilots uniform. He is wearing a Seattle Pilots uniform. There I he believe is. he. I believe he was a. Uh, he was their first draft pick, as evidenced by the back of his bobblehead. There you go. That's going to end up working out. There we go. Actually, that doesn't make sense. He was their first draft pick. That's all oh, yeah. He was a yeah, first draft pick, but yeah, his debut came with the Brewers in 73. Meet, meet, meet. There he is. It's even got a little bat, because like, you can see the knob right there, but no bat, because the bat's on the plastic. What an exciting time oh. for, for our listeners to in this very audio driven uh, medium to to listen to me unbox uh, uh, a bobblehead I got I don't know when. Unboxing videos are popular. People like doing that. Are, we're we, we're getting we, into that foray. Should we become an unboxing channel where we just unbox random things? Like I have a I have a Google Home Mini behind my monitor. We can unbox that. Oh, we could do that. I would like to unbox Jake Paul. Um, You're welcome. That's... Is that the, even the right Paul that does that? I uh, yes. Logan is the YouTuber. Also boxes. Jake is the... Wrestler? No. Logan okay, is... The Lo- other... No, Logan is the YouTuber and wrestler who has also boxed. Yes. Okay. Jake is the other brother who primarily boxes. Who, like, feasts on older boxers that have... Who commits elder abuse? Yeah. Yeah, that's basically... Who, uh... I'm pretty sure knocked out uh, Nate Robinson. I'm pretty sure who is that. That's who he fought. Yes, he did. Yeah, both of them. The Green Bay Packers. Anyways, the Green Bay Packers. Sorry for that little side tangent, folks. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Green Packers beat the Indianapolis Colts last week in what was a breakout game for Josh Jacobs in his second game as a Green Bay Packer. Run all over the Colts in uh in route to a 16 to 10 victory like i said over the cults we have some cheeses to hand out as always we give away three cheeses to uh three packers well a cheese to three packers uh to see who gets a cheese for that week for the uh week's best performers so up for consideration the nominees for cheese board uh this week first and foremost obviously is josh jacobs 32 carries 151 rushing yards one fumble 47 snaps 
77.2 PFF grade. Obviously, should have had two touchdowns, at least one. Um, one was called back due to a penalty. The other one, he fumbled at the goal line. So that was Josh Jacobs' line. Obviously, carried the uh, the team on his back last week in light to uh, look to that win. Next up is Eric Wilson. He had one tackle, one forced fumble, one interception, one pass breakup, all on eight snaps, or only eight snaps. 99.4 PFF grade, the highest rated Packer in the game. Uh, an efficient line for sure from Eric Wilson. Uh, Elton Jenkins and Zach Tom both played 70 snaps. Both did not allow a pressure uh, in that game. Elton Jenkins gets a 70.2 PFF grade, the highest of the O-lineman. Zach Tom gets a 55 point eight grade i disagree with that pff grade i thought he played very well i'm not really sure where they're getting that low of a grade for him but alas that is to what is to be said about pff grades next up is javon bullard five tackles one pbu one target zero receptions allowed 78.3 pff grade xavier mckinney four tackles three with solo one tackle for a loss one pass breakup one interception a 62.8 PFF grade. And then Devontae Wyatt, four pressures, most on the team last week, including one sack. So, Jordan, I have yes. two locks. I'm curious to know if you have any locks for cheeses this week. I as have well. two locks as well. Who's your first? Josh Jacobs. Has to be Josh Jacobs. I. We can have a discussion about how good of his his performance was for the podcast to be entertaining, but I just feel like it would just be kind of beating a dead horse. We all know how good he was on Sunday. It's a lock. It's, it's, yeah. You know what I mean? He was damn good. Damn good. Damn good. Damn good. Who is your uh, second lock? Eric Wilson. Eric Wilson is also my second lock. I feel like this is a, a rare, rarefied error of giving a set cheese to a guy who played eight snaps but I don't think we've ever seen an, an as efficient eight snap performance by any Packer since we started the pod. I would be hard pressed to find if you comb through PFF football data for as long as that goes back. I doubt that there is a higher grade despite what, however many snaps for a single player to, in a Packers game. Yeah, that's pro- I would, I yeah, would I mean, probably guess that'd be about the same. I'm, I'm with you on that one. The efficiency with which I was legitimately like gasped when I saw that he had eight snaps yeah. when snap count stats came out the next mm-hmm. day. And he was just remarkable. He was all over the field. Like he, we talked about it on on Sunday, the Monday pod. But um, obviously, the interception, a really good play. The forced fumble on Jonathan Taylor that ends up getting knocked out of bounds, obviously, a really good play. Excuse me. And then reading the option between Anthony Richardson and I believe it was Trey Sermon to stop them on, I think it was third down, just an awesome yeah. play that looks a lot easier than it actually is. And credit to him for, for playing so well and, and getting that stop. So yeah, Eric Wilson, the second cheese recipient. I have my third decided, but I'm curious as to who your third is. I am kind of a why I am an open book. I think, they are deserving candidates. I do. I, as much as we talked about it like the first week, where it's like, okay, do you, which way do you lean? This is a performance more recognized for the offensive side of the ball in week one. I think this side, it's, you know, you limit the Colts to 10 points. Really, it, that touchdown, as I did not watch in the moment, but that touchdown coming within the final two minutes of the game, I thought it was still low on hand. Yeah. Um, obviously, having the benefit of hindsight or, you know, that the game was done shades me towards that thinking. But mm-hmm. it's where, like, do you, re- I, I, the only exception I would make with going with the line is that look at what they did on the ground. Yeah, you know I mean, mm-hmm. like that is a perfor- like performance worthy of not to just go, you know, that automatically means a, a lineman should get something like that. Yeah. But, you know, when you're playing that well and you're getting that much of a su- success on the ground, especially first half, you kind of be like, well, that is another like 
Feather in the cap. Quiver. Feather in their cap. There you go. So, I know. I'm kind of I'm kind of wide open. I, I, I have a feeling, my guess is that you're going to go Xavier McKinney. You would be right. I, I think, think. I think it'd be irresponsible to not give it to him after he has two interceptions in two weeks. Yeah, you know I was I, mean? I was kind of shocked by the PFF grade two. That was another one that was like, again, these are it's one game sample sizes. Yeah, the, it's I would I would really life. love to know like what dings him so much. You know, like why why Javon Bullard has a better grade than he does, despite who I did who I did think had a way better game than the Eagles game. Bullard. Yes, yeah, like I think he played well for sure. But I think it'd just be not irresponsible, but Xavier McKinney deserves a cheese for his play over the first two weeks. It feels a little contrarian. Yeah, to not give him one when he's had two takeaways in two weeks after we've had not many turnovers in the last couple of years under Joe, Joe Barry. Let's do it. Xavier McKinney, welcome, welcome to the club. to the club. So Josh Jacobs, Eric Wilson, and Xavier McKinney are your Packers players that earn their cheeses for week two. I'm gonna. We're gonna start doing this this year. We're gonna recap who is all on the cheese board after each week, so people, yeah, feel. We did feel a, the present. We did that last year. We did, and I think we forgot a couple of weeks, but we're gonna do it every week. Yep. So it's not a surprise, but like, oh, Aaron Jones had six. Mm-hmm. Uh, the cheese board is currently represented by Jaden Reed, Zach Tom, Elton Jenkins. Josh Jacobs, Eric Wilson, and Xavier McKinney, just like how we drew it up. Yep. All of them have one. Yes. So, soon enough, Jordan Love will be back on that cheese board and will be happy as clams. Mm. So, going into – and put it, closing a book on week two, going into week three as the Packers face their second AFC South opponent in a row. I had to think about that for a moment. Um little bit a couple of roster moves going in the week uh marshawn lloyd heads to ir due to an ankle injury he suffered against the colts um not season ending ir he is free to return in four weeks at minimum but has to sit out at least the next four games chris brooks is elevated from the practice squad a former miami dolphin that the packers picked up um after cut day so i saw a couple clips from him on twitter from the preseason looks like it looks like to be a pretty dynamic runner so we'll see how it goes for him um in lieu of that, the Packers signed wide receiver Cornelius Johnson to the practice squad as well. Uh, the serious history between the Packers and the Tennessee Titans, the Packers are 6-8 and eight when facing the Titans, which includes the Titans' history as the Houston Oilers. Uh, the Packers have never won in Tennessee. They are 0-3 in playing uh, at Nissan Stadium entering the Sunday, and the last time they beat the Titans on the road was when they were the Houston Oilers back in 1992. And the last meeting was that treacherous 2022 game when the when they lost the Titans twenty seven to seventeen at Lambeau, uh, we in week eleven on Thursday night football. I remember that game all too well because it was yeah, that was terrible. It wasn't close. Score was score says it was closer than it was, and it was not. <laughs> no, if I'm not mistaken. That was the week after the Cowboys, right? Like they they thrashed the Cowboys, yes. and then we were like, yeah, Packers, Packers are gonna get on their horse and. Right in the playoffs. No, that is not what happened. No. So, all right. Let's go right into the the injury report. It's long for the Packers this week. For the Packers, I'm going to open up this picture bigger so I can actually read it. Um, as of Thursday's practice, Kenny Clark was a limited participant in practice with a toe injury. Josh Jacobs was also limited with a back injury. Tucker Craft and Jordan Love both limited participants with a shoulder and knee injury, effectively. We'll talk about Jordan Love in a moment. Um, Josh Myers was limited with an ankle injury. Jaden Reed was upgraded from Wednesday to Thursday um, with a calf injury. And then Zach Tom and Rasheed Walker had a quad and a shoulder injury, effectively, and were limited in practice. Folks that did not practice were Carrington Valentine with an ankle injury, Jordan Morgan with a shoulder injury, and I believe that was it. Yes, on Thursday's practice. Kingsley Enigbari was limited on Wednesday and was upgraded to a full participant on Thursday. So, Jordan, 
the game of cat and mouse has continued between Matt LaFleur and opposing AFC South opponents. Obviously opposing opponents. Shout out analysis. Um, last week it was he may not be back or out as long as we thought. He might have a chance to play on Sunday. Comes out Saturday night-ish time that like, hey, he's not playing Sunday, obviously kind of thing. Uh, Malik Willis does that as well that he found out on Saturday morning. Um, now this week Jordan was practicing. He had a uh, sleeve on his left left leg, I believe. I think so. I think so. On his left leg uh, during Wednesday's practice. And then today on Thursday, um, the Beat Reporters video showed they had a little bit of a bulkier uh, brace on that knee. Probably giving it a trial run to see how he feels with it. Can he play with it? Can he throw while on the run? Um, with it on, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think I think Friday and Saturday is going to be really important to see how how it goes for him. Like, I think if he... Um, I think if you... If he feels good tomorrow after playing or practicing with the brace on, that's good. That's progress. And then after, like, I think on Saturday, if there's no issues, we could expect him to play on Sunday. But... For what Vegas knows, if you are into this type of thing, Titans are still favored um, in the game this weekend against the Titans. Like, the Packers against the Titans. Is that three-point favorites? No, is that hmm? is that what you saw? No, I think it was like two and a half or something. Hmm. I don't know what you were putting the three up for but then, but... I didn't know if it... Well, because three is the, the customary mm. home team bump. No, um, let me see if I can find... According to the ESPN odds, it is um, the spread is plus three. Tennessee opened at two and a half. So, yeah, it's a toss-up, essentially. But then, next week, the Packers are favored um, against the Vikings back at home. So, take that however you may, but that's just worth noting. So, I guess, what do you think about Jordan Love there, Jordan? Do you think he plays this weekend? Well, I I want to... It was very hard to keep adding more updates to Jordan Love because I feel like there was at least one every day. A bunch today as we record this. This is Thursday. At, courtesy of ESPN's Adam Schefter, I, I assume he tweeted this outside of his shower. Uh, despite what projected to be a three to four week absence due to his knee injury, there's a chance that Packers quarterback Jordan Love can make it back in time to start Sunday at the Titans. I wouldn't be surprised if he plays this week, said one source. It's definitely day by day, like he said, and 50 50 at best right now. But the larger point might be that even if Love cannot make it back by Sunday, he'll have a realistic chance to return next week at home versus the Vikings, which will mark a two game absence. Also, that would be three weeks. Yeah. Adam Schefter. Yeah. Again, tweeted it outside of the shower. Um, I'm not sure where you're going with that, but I'm just going to let you rock. It is a reference that he made in, in light of Adrian Wojnarowski retiring and that he, you got to check your phone when it's buzzing. Uh, it's positioned in a way that when you're showering, you have to see if it's going off or not. Got it, got it, got it. Which I felt like he was telling more about himself than he was about Adrian Wojnarowski. That's very funny. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, but yeah, I was genuinely surprised by what Rob Domofsky said early in the week. And then Jordan Love is practicing. Is he practicing well? Well, that's a question for a different kind of question. And then Schefter chimes in this morning. Love practices again. The Packers coaching staff is, you know, giving him every chance to play but he's limited i don't think there's a win-win here like i think again i think they want it's kind of a continuation of the gamesmanship if, if that's what you want to call it against the colts the lead up to that game where the floor cut the door open that jordan love if he's ready we're going to give him every opportunity to be ready or if he feels he's ready, we're going to give him every opportunity to be ready. Right. And, you know, it's a tricky injury to come back from. 
especially mid season. You your season just started. Mm-hmm. He's not. It's not like Jordan Love is. You know, we don't think of him as this mobile kind of Mahomes type. Or you know, he certainly is not like athletic to the likes of like Malik Willis per se. Sure. But having that mobility in the pocket, being able to climb pockets that are collapsing or when you're getting pressured and stuff like that, like that is a big part of his game. It's not even just talking about that. It's literally just the rhythms that you generate dropping back, going through your routine, going through your progressions. You know, I, I don't know what I would do in this situation. I think, the Packers gen generally are a very cautious organization when it comes to injuries. We saw it last year, even during the playoffs where like Christian Watson clearly wanted to go and they didn't, they shut him down. I'm forgetting someone else that was kind of in that um, range to Jair. I think, did Jair miss the 49ers game? I always think that he missed the 49ers game, and I, I feel like he actually played, but... Uh, I can check. I think he did play. I can check, though. But Packers are, you know, more cautious than not. They're not going to risk anyone's health over one game, even if it's a playoff game, even if it's a star quarterback. But the dynamics are certainly a little different when your star quarterback play. wants to play. He did play. The dynamics are certainly different when it's your star quarterback that has the agency to kind of flex his muscles. You know, I'm not saying Jordan Love is going to do it in the in the way of Aaron Rodgers, but if he says he feels he's ready to play, I feel like they're going to go and roll with it. So yeah, I I, I again we don't know that answer. Yeah, for, we don't know how comfortable he'll be. Yeah, for for what it's worth, um, I did talk to somebody who like works in PT, and. Again, this is just their secondhand knowledge and source just, knowledge. No, it's not. not. And they said that like MCL injuries are mostly pain tolerance. Like, there's not a whole, not a big risk for like re-injury should you play with it when it's still sore. It's just like a pain tolerance thing, as opposed to, like an ACL yeah. or or meniscus, where if you play, it, you have a risk of actually tearing it. So that's something to to know as well. Like, if he feels fine playing at the brace and he feels good, and the doctors clear him, so so be it. He might play. I think yeah. the the timeline I've been most comfortable with, just like from a, again, not medical person standpoint, just sort of the knowledge that anecdotally that would have that would make me feel comfortable and what, what, and, and what is a weird way to talk about it. But like this game in the context of their standings and the, um, the playoff race that comes down the line at the end of the season, it's an AFC opponent and it's like... It, it, it just doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things of like there's a lot other a lot more tiebreakers that have to go on that have to go to, to a tie before uh the um non-conference schedule record becomes a, a tiebreaker and so i think it's like before i'm guessing you're looking it up i'm guessing it's like four or five but um either which way I think him missing this week and coming back next week against the Vikings like healthy because the Vikings have had a really good defense as of late would be the the route I'd be most comfortable going. But if he's fine to go, so be it. I'm not going to judge it either which way. Of course, hindsight will ultimately rear its head if something goes wrong. But other than that, not too big of an issue. Well, if we're being honest, that could happen any game. Any game. Yeah, I to- you know, totally understand that. Totally get it. Yeah, we, we, I think I'm on the same page as you. As I would feel more comfortable if he sits another game, get a little bit more rest, and then come back against the Vikings. But we'll be like, well, why do you go if he gets hurt? Yeah, like that's just, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that'll be immediately Neither here happens. nor there. But, that'll be immediately what happens. Yeah. But yeah, this it, it does feel more likely that this could be a f- true toss-up and you know friday's practice will probably determine be the biggest indicator of what jordan love is most comfortable doing going into sunday against tennessee yeah absolutely he wants to bring home that win 
at Nissan Stadium. I'm sure a he does. House of Horrors. I'm sure he does. So yeah, that's where the injuries stand. Um, as it pertains to the Packers, there's a lot of them. I'm hopefully I think Jaden Reed is mostly fine to play. I mean, talk about a guy that that, that gets beat up, dude. I just wish him he'd be he'd be healthy for an extended period of time and not keep cropping up on the on the injury report, but so be it. Um, for the Titans, uh, they only had one DMP. Uh, it was Luke Gifford, their linebacker. He was not listed yesterday, but then was a DMP today. Um, and then the only other injury that wasn't vet rest was Ty J Spears, their running back, had an ankle injury. He was a DMP on Wednesday and limited on Thursday, so I would expect him to play. So, looking at that, or coming off of that, the big story coming into this game that isn't Jordan Love is the Malik Willis revenge game. Packers obtain Malik Willis for a seventh round pick uh, late in training camp. I believe it was the day before uh, cut downs. I'm not mistaken, Jordan. Yes, it was. Um, And now he gets a chance to start against his former team. And that has been sort of the talk in the Packers locker room with Malik Willis since uh, his game on Sunday. He said a few times now that he's not looking to get revenge on the team. He doesn't. He's not taking that mindset. Rather, just taking it as they took a chance on him, and he's happy to have that chance. And now he's the Packers took a chance on him as well, and he's hoping to go out there and prove that he was he was worth that chance. So, here's to Malik Willis continuing this. Is, Abba. Yes, that's right. Um, goes to make the most of that chance if he plays and not Jordan Love. Um, that he can show that it wasn't a good idea to give up on him kind of thing. But um, but his first two seasons there, Tennessee is the second best in the league through two games in pass yards per play at 3.6. Uh, best is Seattle at 3.5. For context, they faced Kelly Williams and Aaron Rodgers in weeks one and two. Caleb Williams went 19 of 32, 127 yards with no touchdowns. Aaron Rodgers had 18 of 30, 176 yards and two touchdowns. Um, in both of those games, the opposing uh, teams didn't run very, very well. Only 85 yards, I'm um, sorry, 84 yards for the uh, the Bears against the Titans in Week One, and 101 yards total um, for the Jets in Week Two. So not a whole lot of uh, of offense happening against the Titans defense. You and I were talking um, pre pod briefly about kind of digging into these numbers a little bit. This Titans defense. Is, is seemingly uh, a, a lot better than the Titans' reputation is around the league right now. Titans being kind of publicly clowned, mostly for Malik Willis and how their head coach, I'm sorry, not Malik Willis, how Will Levis' is his, his play is kind of getting clowned with some mistakes and uh, gas that he had made and how their coach seemingly hates him for his comments that he would make post game and things like that. So... I think they have a reputation of being this bad team, but teams aren't really moving the ball against the Titans. They're they're the Titans defense is, is pretty staunch, if you ask me. Yes. There are things that I think despite being on two, despite Will Levis being possibly if it wasn't for Bryce Young. I was gonna say I, I saw multiple people on Twitter say that Will Levis is the worst quarterback in the NFL and respectfully, I'm sorry, Andrew. Like it just it just can't be anybody but Bryce Young at the moment. Caleb yeah, Williams not that far behind. Nor 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 is Bo Nix. There's a lot of bad quarterbacks. I will say right the, the 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 Caleb Williams pivot. This is way too early for Caleb Williams talk, but from the the best situation a rookie quarterback has ever walked into to pivoting as. He's a rookie. He's got to develop a little bit. He's got to you got to give him time. I was like, "Ooh, baby, that backpedal was fast." Sorry, he got his, go ahead. He got his number retired by USC. <laughs> he did. Go go ahead. Bizarre. Anyway, um, there are definitely. Th- I mean, I think this is what the Titans historically are just not this sexy team they don't play in a big they're blue collar they're blue collar they they put on their shoes one feet at a time just like everybody else jordan 
exactly. They put on their their Wranglers. They put on their denim jackets. They walk around the town. They go down Broadway because they play at Nashville. Did you just say they put on their Wranglers and their denim jackets? Are you are you assuming that the Titans had their well, when you're blue collar? You're wearing blue collars. You know, gall darn it. You do understand that blue collar doesn't mean denim, right? That's how I associate blue collar. <laughs> Could you imagine just walking into your <laughs> Jay Leno? Your Jay Leno collar. wears a Canadian tuxedo every <laughs> everywhere he goes. He's blue collar to me. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. To um, that was just a funny visual. They don't play a sexy brand of football, either with Never Mike Vrabel being this coaching genius, as everybody lamented when he got fired. He was more pragmatic than he was as like this. You know, a Belichick acolyte of just winning that game. It doesn't matter how it looks. We're going to craft a game plan for each and every game. I don't know if that's carried over into Brian Callahan. Obviously, he's only two games into being a head coach. Hates it, but apparently. Hates it. He hates really it. hates it. He's got to talk to his dad, who's on the coaching staff. He's got, he's got to talk to talk shit about Will Levis in the public media just to try and get some, reverse some of the venom out. Nepo, reverse Nepo baby. Open baby. Because Nepo. Uh, yeah, it's, reverse. it's bad. Keep going. Sorry. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is Titans are just kind of like always there. They're always there. So really, like, whatever kind of outside of, like, Derrick Henry or, like, individual brilliance, the Titans just kind of that. But when you dig into, like, what they could be and the things that, like, just we'll get into other things. But the defense has always kind of been their calling card, at least playing, like, a gritty style of football. If they – I just – I associate Tennessee Titans games – Winning like twenty one to eighteen or losing eighteen to twenty, it's just these yeah. kind of games that always just like linger on. Did you have to? Yeah, I mean, I I'm with you. They're they're a hard nose football team on defense. Have for a while now. Like you talk about like the different brand of football they play. I mean, I think that's evidenced by just how long they had to run Derrick Henry out there and be a a, a bruising team with him leading the way for most games. And then, like you said, they're a uh, just a a blue collar team that plays tough defense, which is Mike Vrabel's calling card before he left, obviously. But it's not like they have um, like slouches up front either. Like they have Harold uh, Landry, who's a, an edge rusher. He's got six pressures through two games. That's pretty. It's pretty good. Some might say. Um, their their best lineman, Jeff or uh, Jeffrey Simmons. It doesn't even have a pressure. He only has like five tackles, it looks like. So he he's looking to get off uh to a better start. Then Tavondre Sweat, he's got two um two pressures, and then Sebastian Joseph Day, their other good D lineman, also has um a, uh, two pressures. And so I mean Harold Landry has three sacks through through two games. I think that's that's darn good. And so yeah. like that's not even talking about um the Jerry Sneed as a cornerback. Like he He's he's a good guy to throw to, or to not throw to. Like you don't want to throw his way. And then, yeah, I think that this have this have a, a talented, a talented defense. And so, I think it says a lot that both games are twenty four seventeen for the Titans. Like they can't really do a whole lot of offense at the moment as Will Levis tries to shake off the extreme rust he has. But we'll talk about him in a minute. But. 24 points allowed isn't that isn't that much and i know for sure that a couple of those were special teams um special teams touchdowns like i know obviously will Levis through the pick six um in the in the first game that kind of sealed it for them i'm trying to pull up the uh the play-by-play here yeah the pick six was the uh Oh, they didn't even have a touchdown offense. The Bears didn't. Jonathan Owens had a, uh, no. had, a had a blocked punt for twenty one yards, and then the, the pick six on defense, and then three three field goals, and so like that in and of itself is not much of offense doing there. And then looking at the um, the the Jets game, I think Braylon Allen only had two touchdowns, um, just on little screen passes from from Aaron Rodgers. And then yeah. It was, 
my apologies, three touchdowns, two to Braylon Allen, one to Brees Hall, but it's just it's just not a whole lot. Like Aaron Rodgers only had 176 passing yards, and so yeah. it, there's just not a lot of offense going around. You, you know what I mean? And so yeah, I think what's going to be important for this, and I believe I'm making sure I'm not jumping the gun here on our talking points, but the if the Packers can get the running game going, that's going to be incredibly huge against this defense because if they can't get the run game going, they have to start letting or having Malik Willis pass the ball more. I think that's going to dictate how this game goes. We saw him, Malik Willis, making some good throws last week, but except for the fact that he wasn't really unleashed all that much, I don't know if you would agree with that, but like watching some tape back this week, he was making good throws he just didn't have a whole lot of throws to make, you know, like there was, he had the one to Don Tavian Wicks for the touchdown that, that was really good. He had a couple other ones that were timed well, that were really good. The pass from Dobbs was, was a great catch by, by Romeo, but I don't think it's going to be 53 to what? 18 again for runs to passes. I just don't think it, it's going to, I don't think the Packers are going to have the opportunity to have the balance be that unbalanced. Like, I don't, I think it's going to be closer to, not, I'm not going to say even, but it'll be a little less lopsided than it was last week. Well, and the, this is the thing is that now it's on tape. The Titans know what they're going to do. Now it's on tape, and they're going to expect a heavy dose of the run game. Yeah. So you can't pull the, off the same magic trick twice against the Titans' defense that, to their credit, has played. They've it kept them in games. Yeah, you know I mean, they're not giving up explosive plays, despite the fact that the Packers have the most uh, explosive plays in the league right now, which is yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, from that standpoint, yeah, you're. This is going to be a more. I would say I, I think it's going to be a similar scoreline to last week, only it will fit that game rather than. We might not like. We'll talk about missed opportunities and squandered chances, but not in the way that it felt like to blow the game open. Yeah. You know I mean, it would be more like to w- just simply win the game. Yeah. I totally agree with you there. Totally agree with you. They're just going to have to be more efficient in their offense. Um, I should say more efficient. I would. Yeah. Or is that, is that well, the point I'm efficient... trying to make is that they can't leave points on the board. Yes. I, I think, Far too. We're only ten, two games in, but we could probably look to four, five plays that should have been touchdowns that you had to turn already this either, year. Yeah, it, that you had to turn into field goals, or you lost the ball because Josh Jacobs lost at the goal line. You mm-hmm. know what I mean, like, so yeah, that's and granted, you know, going into this game, if Malik Willis is quarterback. The higher it's it's a higher likelihood that we will be talking about those things if he doesn't have the chemistry that he showed you know over fourteen throws yeah against the Colts right I think that that is the other factor going back to the Willis thing is that there's a team that knows how to play Malik Willis Tennessee Titans yeah if there's a team that knows his mannerisms and knows how to defend against him it's gonna be the Titans yeah obviously. so that it in itself you know, brings a different challenge to this game as much as it could be a revenge game. Mm-hmm. It could also just be very uncomfortable for him to play against a team that knows him better than anybody else currently, even the Packers. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. There a lot of a lot of wrinkles, a lot of variables that could tilt this game in all sorts of different directions. And I got to admit, not a lot of positive ones. <laughs> No, I like. I think there's opportunity for for the offense to really click this game. Should it should it go well? But like, I'm not too high on on their on their secondary outside of um, Legereus Sneed. Like whoever is yeah. not whoever is not being covered by Legereus Sneed uh, has an opportunity to have a big impact on this game. Whether that's Romeo Dobbs, Dontavian Wicks, or Jaden Reed. Like I think Christian Watson's probably going to be the guy. The um, going to be the guy that gets covered by Snead, but we'll see. But outside of that, there's opportunity there, but it's going to require precise throws. It's going to require some some good scheming from from Matt LaFleur and company to get Malik Willis some easy throws to begin with. I think similar to how they used them 
in the game against the Colts. Get him some easy throws on curls to Tucker Craft and things like that. And then start opening up a little bit. But you have to do it sooner. You can't rely on having 100 yards before the before the halftime from, from Josh Jacobs. It's just going to have to be a sooner uh, execution of, of the offense from there. Yeah. So, all right. From the offense, uh, I think this game is really going to be decided by the Packers defense. Like, we, we're finally getting to the point where this... This Jeff Halfley defense has a chance to really get after the quarterback. We saw it two weeks in a row now where they tried to contain and successfully contained, I guess, for, I'll say, seven quarters, two of the more dynamic running quarterbacks in the NFL, Jalen Hurts and Anthony Richardson. Well, I say seven because, like, yeah, the the last, the fourth quarter of the Eagles game, Jalen Hurts was kind of having his way as um, they needed to go down the field a little bit, so... Um, but now Will Levis, not the most like mobile quarterback, not known for making play with the, plays with his legs. Um, Mayo Mahomes, as they call him, which is hilarious at this point, um, ranks 28th out of ES, uh, out of 31 in ESPN's QBR, 36 out of 38 in PFF's passing grade. Uh, his 67.3 passer rating ranks 25th out of all 32 c- quarterbacks that would qualify for the stat. He's been sacked seven times through two games so far and has been pressured 39 times. That is an insane, insane amount of times, Jordan. Um, He's been pressured on 53% of his passes, the highest for any quarterback this season. So every other time he drops back, he's getting pressure in his face from from rushers. Um, The Packers on the flip side only have three sacks this season, 26th out of the, uh, uh, or 26th in the league. Um, the third lowest, the third lowest sack percentage. The Packers opponents have an average of three point one five seconds to throw this year, second worst in the league. Despite that, they have a thirty two point one uh, pressure rate on dropbacks, which is exactly in the middle of the league at sixteen. And as we mentioned, Levis not a very mobile quarterback. So, with that being said, this line is ripe, ripe for rushing. Like I think. Going into another point here in a, in a second, Rashawn Gary, Lucas Van Ness, Preston Smith, Kenny Clark, Devontae Wyatt, I'll have prime opportunity to get home against against Will Levis. Um, like I had said, the Titans O-line has allowed 33 pressures. Um, yeah, 30 different numbers, probably different websites that we got them from regardless. A lot of pressures through two weeks, including... All of those sacks, seven hits and twenty-two hurries, according to uh, according to PFF. Their left tackle, J.C. Latham, has six pressures and three hurries and a sack allowed through two games. Their right tackle, Nicholas Pettit Frier, I'll say, has allowed eleven pressures and two sacks allowed, which I believe is Rashawn Gary's typical side is the right tackle side. So, yep, this is a time for Rashawn Gary to feast. But looking at how Rashad Gary was going against Lane Johnson. That's a tough assignment. And then, uh, I believe... Quinn Nelson? I think so, is the other one? Possibly. Regardless, he didn't get home against Anthony Richardson, Anthony Richardson much at all either. But I think this is the time that they're really going to put pin their ears back and get after the quarterback. The entire line is a problem, though. Um, of their starters, of the five stars on the line, only the center has less than three pressures allowed through two games the rest have over three which is not great considering most of your pressure on the quarterback comes from the outside (laughs) yeah this is a Tennessee Titans team that moved on from Andre Dillard and they somehow got worse and they somehow got worse protection and drafted what everybody felt was the best offensive lineman in this class with JC Latham Yep, and not that drafted... one lineman is going to fix that, but no. And they pra- uh, drafted Peter Skaronsky last year, the guy that we had kind of looked at, who has quietly been not very good. I looked at his stats yeah. from last year and his stats through two games, and they've been suspect at best. So their line is definitely um, a problem coming into the season, obviously. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I, I, this is. It, it's been talked about pretty much everywhere. It was the stat that was being shared after the Colts win on Sunday by Packers beat writers of just the pressure machine that Will Levis is facing. No wonder he's struggling as much as he is. 
because he's under fire ever after every snap, every other snap. Um, but yeah, it's time for a bit of a breakout, whether that's by committee, whether that's Rashawn Gary doing a one man wrecking crew impression. Um, again, I don't fault the Packers for being, you know, only having three sacks to the season. I think they played the game plan that they needed to. It worked last week. It didn't necessarily work for it progressively progressively did not work in week one. Um, but if you want to play this game where, you know, it's not just about getting turnovers as much as we are like over the moon about that. That is certainly one way to disrupt a team's rhythm is that just get them off the field entirely. It's about setting them back, pushing field position back, getting your offense the best, you know, position literally and figuratively to put together a drive. Yeah. You know I mean, like this is not, I, I think it's going to be billed as, and we'll talk about it come Sunday, obviously, but if you do not meet a certain level of expectation of just that pressure, kind of the mantras that have been talked about throughout the summer of with Halfley of just like playing aggressive ball. Don't think just react, react, react. If they don't meet that standard that we obviously have for this game and this offense, it'll be, it will certainly be be disappointing and it will certainly be disheartening that, you know, you have this opponent at your doorstep and you didn't really do much to do with it. So hopefully it meets in the middle or goes to the positive direction rather than us lamenting that the Packers didn't do much with their chances with a offensive line that clearly has had protection problems from the start of this year. Yeah. Strong agree with all of that. Like it's been two games. It will be three after Sunday, obviously, but I, I worry that if they don't get after the, the quarterback don't get after will levis this game that there's gonna be rumblings about like what are we doing kind of thing like all respect to rashawn gary i expect at least a sack from him this game like he has to get home at least once and whether that's like i'm not saying it has to be one but if he doesn't get home he has to have at least like five hits on him you know what i mean like i going off of pff stats and stuff like that like i'm expecting for Sean Gary to be in the backfield a whole lot this game. I'm expecting all the pass rushers to be in the backfield a whole lot this game. And like you said, like as good as it is to be getting turnovers as, and to be getting interceptions, interceptions from Xavier McKinney and Eric Wilson and forcing fumbles and things like that, the the, the real drive killers in the NFL are sacks and, and holding penalties on the offense. And so how do you do that? Well, you have a dynamic pass rush that they, they can't protect against. Either get home yeah. or draw a penalty. And so... It, either which way, it, it is have to put the pressure on Will Levis this game, and I really like I said, I want to see them put their pin their ears back and get after it because the, we have good pass rushers on this team, and I want to see what they can do in this new defensive scheme now that they don't have to worry about Will Levis running all over them because I don't think he really wants to do that, and so force him into making mistakes, force him into getting out of the pocket and trying to force something, make him jump over his own lineman again and try and back backwards pass, make him fall forward to it. Is that something that happened? Yeah. That's, that was the, the flub last week. He was scrambling. Like I didn't see anything. So yeah. So you saw week one when he, uh, surrender Cobra on the field after he threw the pick six, when he's on his knees, hands on his head last week, he was in the pocket. They're on like the 15 yard line, maybe probably, probably even closer. And he was in the pocket, he tried to scramble out of it, and he turned to his left to go, and his lineman had fallen down, it was on the ground. And so he jumped over him, like, dove over him, and tried to, like, underhand pass the ball to his running back. Well, it didn't get there, and it bounced on the ground, it was a fumble, and the Jets picked it up. Like, it was... I need to see this. Go look it up. It's bad news, Bears, dude. And that's what got Brian Callahan so pissed. He was seen coming off the field, he was, what the F are you doing? Like he was upset and justifiably so. And second, 
highest search term was Will Levis gets yelled at. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> and so, like, it's just like, there's opportunity here. And I really want to see these guys get home. Like, I want this defense to be mean. I want this defense to be playing hard and making life a living hell for the Tennessee Titans. And that's, like you said, what Jeff Halfley has been preaching all offseason since he's gotten the job. Play with oh, intensity. God. Don't think, just react. Are you, did you see it now? Yeah. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> and so that's what I'm talking about. Force him to make dumb plays or just make the good plays yourself. And spoiler alert, my Packers to watch are going to be in this unit later when we, when we make those predictions because not if i pick them first that's fine Sorry. i'll pick a different one <laughs> but it just like i don't mean to sound so so uh like fervor and, and and passionate but like we've got good pass rushers we drafted lucas van Ness last year Rashawn gary got a massive contract last year let's see that pay dividends let's see kenny clark blow up lloyd cushionberry and get in the backfield and get a sack Let's see uh, J.C. Latham get beat off the edge by Preston Smith. Let's see Nicholas pettit Freer get absolutely demolished by Rashawn Gary. I want this game to be decided on the defensive side of the ball. Like, I don't you want, want it. You want this to be like Rock'em Sock'em Robots. I do. I'm just... serious. Because, like, at that point, you have to force them to, to, to run the ball, and we'll talk about Tony Pollard in a second, which is kind of what they've been doing so far this year. But if they become one-dimensional, you'd hope, knock on wood, that the Packers will be able to defend against the run. Yeah. If they can't expect them to throw the ball. Yeah. So let's talk Tony Pollard. Tony Pollard comes from uh from, from Dallas after a disappointing year last year in his first year. First year? Second year. I think it was I forget. I forget how many years he played for the Cowboys. Uh, I believe that was Zeke. His fourth. No, without Zeke. Uh, that was his first. That yeah, was his first. it was only last year. So yep. um, this year, he's 12th in the league in, in yards uh, through two games with 149 and has one touchdown. He also has eight catches on 10 targets for 52 yards and a touchdown. He's been very effective out of the backfield uh, with 42 rushing attempts, but he also has 52 attempts running a route, um, or 52 routes ran, essentially, this season. So... While he two cards come out, I <laughs> sorry, I don't know what that was. I don't you know. You just kept saying the word. You kept saying fifty two, and this is how my brain works. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Yes. He has. <laughs> wow. That has that has derailed me. Uh, I'd be curious to know anecdotally how how the split is for other running backs, but like having more routes ran than rushes through a part in the season, I feel like that's pretty in my mind. Maybe I'm wrong. I feel like that's a pretty unique thing. I hate, I hate using pretty unique because it's either unique or it isn't, but it's a pretty interesting, like focal point for yeah, the, you. for the Tennessee Titans, like offense. Like I feel like yeah. it should be flip flops, but whatever. Um, obviously Tony Pollard isn't the runner that Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor are, but he uh, still, he is still effective. And he had good yards against the Jets and the Bears. The Packers have let up a lot of all-purpose yards to opposing runners this year. They were the fourth worst in rushing yards over expected at plus 81, meaning that they've allowed 81 more yards than they were expected to allow uh, this year thus far, only behind uh, the Eagles, the Giants, and the Raiders. So I'm all for getting after Will Levis. That is that is the goal this week, right? We want to make that backfield absolutely hell. If they're going to do that, they have to be sure they can stop the run. And that's that's where it gets a little tenuous, right? Because we've yeah. yet to see them really stop the run. I know I said I was a fan of how they handled Jonathan Taylor on Sunday against the Colts. But he ultimately still goes for hard yards. And on 12 carries. On 12 carries. And so if Tony Pollard gets there on like 20, 25 carries, that's a better day against the run. Like make them run a whole lot to get that yardage versus the extremely efficient day that Jonathan Taylor had. So um, yeah, that, that those are my thoughts on, on, on Tony Pollard and the fact that 
if they get after Will Levis, they're going to have to stuff the holes too and make sure that that uh, Tony Pollard doesn't cause them headaches on the ground. Yeah, I think whether it's at this point, it's not just about who they're going up against. It's about how the Packers react to taking away the run. Like, this is just kind of, it's, we want to go into every game about, like, taking away their best weapon, you know what I mean? Or making life tougher for the number ones, the playmakers, skill wep- or skill players, whatever. Um, Pollard is going to be tough in the fact that he's someone that can do damage on the ground, can do damage doing screen passes, whatever, if he's like the safety duval for Levis, which obviously, whether he's twisting the air like a gymnast and f- trying to throw the ball behind his back, whatever, um, he clearly is going to utilize those safety valves, whether they're actually safety or not. Um, I don't know. He He's very interesting. I think he's obviously, he had a down year. He obviously left Dallas that, Oh, he didn't leave yeah. Dallas. They said you could. Here's the door. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but I think he. It's early, but we could start. We could see more of what he was prior to last year, prior to Zeke leaving, and kind of being that number one by default. And I know you've sang Taji Spears' praises. Yeah, I. Th- thought he'd be better than he's been yeah but he's also a nice change-up guy that could give the Packers problems too yeah. so like I also think that he just doesn't get used a whole lot I also think he's he's still hurt he's got that ankle injury he's not cropped up on he the did field. get hurt yeah. yeah he did get hurt last week so Limited we'll see practice, how but good he is. we'll see um but yeah if Tony Pollard if the easiest way to shut down Will Levis is obviously to pressure him but if you take away the ground game and make it Will Levis has to save the day. I I would be way more comfortable with that. I would tell you. Yeah. This is also this is their first home game this year, right? No, I think they played in Tennessee against the Bears. I I think that was at Chicago. Was it? Um, let me look. Let me take a look. See. I don't know um, for sure. I don't know why I randomly just brought that up, but I, I do think I wonder if that is. Uh, they were home against the Jets. Oh, they were at oh, Bears. Okay. At Bears, home against the Jets. Interesting. Well, there goes that point. Either way, yeah, I think. Yeah. I please, please make Will Levis play hero ball. That yeah, that sounds like a wonderful time to watch Jordan. We'd be. I would love it. He heeing and ha haing all over this podcast on Sunday, to if, if that's how this went, how this shook out. He heeing ha ha. I mean, you saw the play. 10 minutes ago. I did. That is Will Levis playing hero ball. Remarkably dumb. Yeah, the, the, the Surrender Cobra is the picture of the year. That's just that's just how it is. Like, <laughs> it, it was good. It was good. I hate that it had to benefit the Bears, but that was quite the funny uh, funny instance. So, yeah. um, Last point before we get into predictions. Gotta keep Kelvin Ridley in check. Despite Will Levis's play this year, Kelvin Ridley has had a pretty good season thus far. Seven catches on 13 targets for 127 yards and a tutty. Um, has the highest Ridley has the highest air yards per target at 22.8. So they're getting the ball getting the ball to him down the field. Um, puts a lot of pressure on Jair and Xavier McKinney to keep him in check. I think they'll have a lot of success against Calvin Ridley if they just keep Xavier, Xavier McKinney um, up high. And just let him roam and make sure that Kelvin Ridley is not getting wide open kind of place. So that's uh, that's where Xavier McKinney really, I don't want to say thrives, but that's why you bring in Xavier McKinney is for guys like yes. this. Yeah, it, it's, you're not, you're taking away the top. It, it, that is, it's where Darnell Savage, Jonathan Owens, Rudy Ford, like that thread of the big play receiver like Calvin Ridley, who, he even with Will Levis being Will Levis, Kevin really has the highest average depth of target of any receiver. So they're gonna go for the big play. 
whether it lines up or not, we'll see. But all it takes is one play for Packers to let up, and they might be staring at a you know six zero deficit to start the game or whatever. So, in order to avoid those explosive plays, I think we'll see a lot of doubling or you know. Dave Rickini, it doesn't look like he's going to shade one way and then once the play starts after the snap, he starts going where Calvin Ridley goes. Like it it's just right. feels very inevitable that a lot of this game will come down to how the coverage is designed to limit or take away Calvin Ridley from the Titans game plan. But mm-hmm. you know, he's a very talented wide receiver that could easily just Rip that game plan apart. <laughs> yeah, but I think that also depends on how well Levis can get him the ball, which comes back to my big point yeah. of pass rush. So, uh, all right, players to watch, Jordan. Who is your first one? I believe it is your turn to go first. It is. Um... We didn't talk too much about him. Going into this game, but I think Josh Jacobs is mine. Okay. Um, Titans kind of kept running backs in check so far this year. Jonathan Taylor, I believe, was 16 carries, 48 yards. I only recited that verbatim because I had to do this last week. Um, Who? Jonathan Taylor in week one against Tennessee. Did it play the Colts and played Tennessee week one? Yeah, they they played the, the Colts. No, they didn't. The Bears played Tennessee week one. Who the heck? They played the Texans. <laughs> I was like, you you put my brain in a in a whole big mess right there. It's that tit- Titans, Texans. This is how, this is what it is. It's the Titans. I just forget about them. That's fine. They're blue collar. <laughs> and. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway. Um. My point's blown up. Anyway, they've kept running backs in check. Josh Jacobs, I think, obviously, the variable is what quarterback do we get? If it's Jordan Love, how, you know, you're kind of limited either way, no matter what. So, yeah, you're still going to have to heavily lean on Josh Jacobs kind of either breaking out with big runs or if you want to play a more grinded out possession style game. Josh Jacobs is good for both of those. Yeah. That's the that's the good thing about Josh Jacobs. They could play either game. Yeah. So I think de- how successful he is running the ball and kind of keeping things on track for this offense that obviously has a big question of who will play a quarterback and how well they'll they'll end up playing. Josh Jacobs is the known commodity. He's the safe, you know, presence there that you hope will be utilized a lot again. So right. I'll go with Josh Jacobs. Um, for context, week one, the Titans let up 84 total yards on the ground. Their highest rusher was DeAndre Swift, who had 10 carries for 30 yards. Yes. So yes. Um, last week, Braylon Allen and Brees Hall had a little bit of a of a more more success, like I said earlier in the pod, 101 total yards. Uh, Brees Hall led the team with 62 uh, total yards on 14 carries, followed up by Braylon Allen's seven for 33 yards. So there's that. Uh, my player to watch is Rashawn Gary. I have high expectations for you, Mr. Mr. Gary. I expect you to get... Mr. Gary. I expect you to get at least one sack, a lot of pressures in there as well, and really disrupt this game. It's, it's time to... It's time to go. Um... Conversely, my what? What? I just love it's time to go. Is it not? It was just funny how you said it. It is. It, 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 it's time. I'm not saying it's time for the show is worth because he's a good player. But top tier edge rushers need to be having games where they impact the game through sacks. And this is, this is that game. Like, you just have to put your imprint on it someplace. Like, I don't mean to, like... Will Levis is a jar of mayonnaise, and Rashawn Gary better eat all of it. That's what he's got to do. Oh. Well, I'm just saying. We got to keep the mayonnaise analogies going. Do we? My point being is that, like, 
Rashawn Gary hasn't had a game in recent memory that ha- he has affected as badly as like, um, like Chris Jones has, or as which is like a D line, not the same, but like the Bosa brothers or Max Crosby, or I'm trying to think of another elite edge rusher, um, like Micah Parsons, kinda, um. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Are you like, saying Micah Parsons kind of as in he's an elite edge rusher or having, like, these game-breaking games? Game-breaking games. Yeah. Yeah, because, like, I think Micah Parsons... I think is, the like, last the time fringe. we saw him was when he was, he was on those snap counts last year. That, I, that I was would when, agree. Is that yeah. he, when he takes, like, has... He only has to go full force for a, a couple of snaps. He was doing very well. I think the Bears game was that or something early on the season like that. Saints. Saints yeah, like Saints three game. sacks or something like that. But, like that's what we want to see and like if it's a conditioning issue like that's a different problem we have this like not we but the packers have to solve but like take over a game i'm just i just want to see it because i think it's important that this front gets home to quarterbacks and this is the first week we'll be able to see it after having to face two mobile qbs that they have to contain the edge or to set the edge and contain it so that's that's just where i'm where i'm parked right now so Rashawn Gary, my Packer to watch for this week. My uh my Colt to watch, I'm probably stealing yours, is Tony Pollard. Gotta Interesting. Gotta keep the run game in check. And uh yeah, I, I made my point earlier. I'm gonna say seriously, I'm gonna say Calvin Ridley, because I think he is good. Um are you going to say jokingly? Just wait. Okay. I worry... Um, I worry how Jair is going to match up on him because I would assume that number one versus number one. Let's lock in, Jair. Let's not, let's not screw around today. Okay? Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. I don't know why I went into Dana Carvey as doing George W. Not going to do that. Not gonna do it today. Yeah. Um, jokingly, it's Will Levis because I just want to see a car crash. I just yeah. want to see. I need to see this. Yeah. I Ooh. need to see. No, yes. go, go ahead. Touch point. No, I just, I just want to see the Packers. Just like, really, I want him to be benched. I don't think it comes to that. And it could. It can. It, it can. Will. I think if he makes another really dumb mistake that we've probably seen Mason Rudolph. But that's what I was gonna say. You hear those jingling bells? Dude, were you doing Warriors? <laughs> were you doing the bottles? Is that what that was? No, I was doing jingling bells. Oh, for okay, got it. I thought you were doing the the Warriors. That's, <laughs> that's what I thought you were doing. What? <laughs> uh who is your fantasy player, Jordan? Oh, this is a tough one. I think last week I said Braden Norris. <laughs> you did say Braden Norris last week. That is. A I don't think it was that far off, which is kind of sad. Um, I'm gonna go Josh Jacobs, but I don't feel good about it. Okay. He he might just be like a yard eater up and get points that way. A yard a eater upper. Yeah. Is that what Trademark. is that what you I heard? Trademark. Got it. Put that put that on a shirt. Um mine is going to be Romeo Dobbs. Oh. Opposite of Legarius Sneed. If he ends up being on Legarius Sneed, then that probably is going to be a moot point. But uh yeah, I think one of the receivers is going to have a better week than they had last week. Alright. Pre oh, were you gonna say something? I'm calling uh, no, I'll just do another. I'll add it on to my prediction. Okay. Uh, predictions. I'm going Packers 24, Titans 17. I'm typing in. In case you didn't Google. know, it was the pa- the Titans lost their first two games 24 17. So I'm continuing that trend. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I typed into Google what is a garbage NFL score because I think this God. game will do it. 
I don't know, Doc. I you was... had a pretty garbage score last week. For for context, folks, Jordan had 31-12 Colts last week. I don't apologize. You should. No, I was in doom. It, it was doom and gloom, and now we're... I'm sorry. You were doom. Nobody else was doom and gloom. I predicted 2017, and they won, so... That's right. Okay. Roll your eyes. I'm going to say <laughs> Hackers... <gasps> Packers, 22. Ew. They scored two point. Okay. Tennessee, 16. Ew. How did they get there? One touchdown, three goals. <laughs> oh. Also, Braden Narvison revenge game. We forgot about that. Yep, that is, yep. Brandon my other predi- revenge game, Millie Willis revenge game, and Matt Lafleur's return to Tennessee. That is true. My re- uh, my uh, prediction was I think Christian Watson gets a touchdown. Ooh, I could see that. Could definitely see that. So, all right, folks, that does it for this episode of Talk of the Tundra. As always, thank you for listening. We appreciate you. Uh, go check out gspn.info. Jordan's keyboard has fucking melted with how much he's been writing for the Substack. So if you yes. want to read all of these great articles, go check them out. He just published one on Josh Jacobs this today, I believe, on Thursday. We had one uh, earlier in the week, if you are a subscriber, um, talking about the cheese board and all the stats pertaining to last week's, um, or, I'm sorry, yeah, the week one recipients of the cheeses and things like that so go check that out there's a free preview if you want to check out the little blurb we had before we get into some of the stats um but yeah gsp and after darks jordan was on with ty and rohan this week on gsp and after dark to talk the nba predictions pod if i'm not mistaken jordan you guys just did the west this time correct we only did Western Conference over unders. We talked about the Portland Trailblazers. We talked about the Oklahoma City Thunder. We <laughs> talked about the Los Angeles Clippers and 12 more Western Conference teams. You, you picked such a weird group. Like, I know that you were just Welcome. listing Western Conference teams, but like the Trailblazers, <laughs> the Thunder, and the Clippers is such a well, weird three. You could have already like, listened to. You could have gone like Suns. You could have gone Lakers and Timberwolves. You could have gone like Nuggets, Timberwolves, Suns. But <laughs> no. if you listen to, it, it's an inside joke to the weird order that we went through because mm. that is how the Action Network had the strangest consensus rankings I've ever seen in my life. That they, they did not organize. They went from the Bucks to the Magic to the Pacers to there was no rhyme or reason for why the over unders were set that way. So that's that was my little So if you want to go to hear that. that nonsense and about yes. how the action network is apparently doo doo in in that ordering scenario, go check <laughs> out GSPN After Dark in the Substack, eight dollars a month. And you get all your GSPN uh, podcasts ad free and you can put them right into your RSS feed. So how about that? Um, speaking of all things Eurostep, uh, Ty and Rohan released an episode of Eurostep this week talking about uh, formulating a Brook Lopez succession plan and evaluating the Bucks' top G League prospects. Go check that out. The Brewers have clinched the NL Central as of uh, Wednesday night as they walked off the Phillies and then the Cubs lost against the Oakland A's. So the Brewers are your back-to-back NL Central champions. Adam and Andrew dropped a uh, the pod today, Thursday. So go check that out as the uh, Brewers get their series of uh, their four game series at the Diamondbacks underway. And then make time for us to check out. We talked about it last episode, but the Twisters episode along with Trap and Rebel Ridge over there. Um, also, if you're earnestly looking for Bucks content, shout out Ty. He did a great job over on Hardwood Knox talking about Bucks um, offseason over there. So go check Ty out on that pod. That's all for us, folks. Uh, Thank you for listening. We'll be back in your podcast feeds either late Sunday night or early Monday morning, depending on when this all comes out. But rest assured, people, we will be back in your podcast feeds uh, very soon. And if I'm not mistaken, Jordan, I need to pull up our our podcast thing real quick. This is the worst spot to do this announcement. But if I'm not mistaken, 
this pod itself is our 150th episode. So this is the worst spot for it to go. But I remembered I need to upload it, and I was like, that number is coming up. So if you stay through all of the ads, let us know, because this is the worst spot for it. So thank you, everybody, for listening to 150 episodes of Talk the Tundra and helping us uh, get there and keep it going for the last two and a half years. We appreciate it. And Jordan, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you.